Okay, it is now 2 p.m. New York time, and I think we will get started. Hello and welcome everyone. It is my very great pleasure to welcome you to our breakout session during the UN Global Compact Leaders Summit and our 20th anniversary celebration. Our session uh, here today is of course focused on human rights and is entitled to do your diligence, human rights at the core of sustainable development. My name is Julie Garfield Kofoot and I am the head of human rights here at UN Global Compact. Um, as mentioned in the chat function, please let us know throughout the session if you have any questions at all and make sure to post them in the chat and we'll do our very best to get to those questions and answer them live towards the end of the session. So to kick off today, first speaker, Sigrid Kag, Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Corporation of the Netherlands. Excellency, distinguished guests, a warm welcome. It's an honor to be the opening speaker at this session. We meet under tremendously challenging circumstances, very different from what we all would have imagined when we thought of the anniversary six months ago. We are in crisis, but as the dust slowly settles, two things are clear. Our economies have major flaws and we need to change our behavior. History shows all crises are different and they require different solutions. They change the world and our way of life. The Great Depression taught us societies must help their most vulnerable members. The financial crisis taught us that banks cannot be allowed to operate unchecked. This year's lesson is sustainability as the foundation of profitability. As you all know, the Global Compact encourages companies around the world to be a force for good by respecting human rights, labor rights, and caring for the environment, as well as, of course, fighting corruption. These actions serve to protect human rights, the cornerstone of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The road to 2030 is one we must all travel, especially now governments face the Herculean task of mitigating the impact of COVID-19 on society and preventing collapse. But governments cannot do it alone. Companies have to play their part, and maybe the heaviest of all, vis-a-vis -vis producers, suppliers and consumers. COVID-19 has put companies under pressure and as a result their efforts may founder. Although I understand these are difficult times, it's exactly in times like these that taking responsibility is most essential. In times of crisis, the companies that are able to adapt and to change their behavior are most likely to thrive when the economy recovers. I joined the ILO OECD and others in calling on you, companies and CEOs, to demonstrate ethical leadership and to continue the promotion of responsible business conduct. If there was ever a time to do this, that time is now. So I'm pleased that these organizations have clarified what responsible business conduct means and what it should look like during the pandemic. Responsible purchasing practices is one area. Structural dialogue with suppliers and employees, transparency, and of course, clear communication, constant communication. Steps are being taken by governments to help companies providing a level of playing field. The EU is working on an initiative to ensure all member states have an adequate minimum wage. My ambition is to achieve this globally. That is why the Netherlands supports the ILO's efforts to calculate living wages in different countries. These data will be useful in the pursuit of this shared ambition, but the road to this goal will be a long and winding one. Currently, the first concern is to retain and to shield existing jobs, but we must not lose sight of decent working conditions and a fair living wage. The pandemic should not result in a race to the bottom, neither in child labor or considering poor working conditions. The members of the UN Global Compact are perfectly positioned to demonstrate leadership and take this now. This won't always be easy. Many companies obviously see a drop in revenue 
and they face tremendous pressures from workers, suppliers, and shareholders. But society as a whole is calling for your leadership, and that leadership will be rewarded and rewarding in the way you choose to execute it. As societies begin to open up, I call upon you as leaders of industry to reconnect, to foster a sustainable society post-COVID. Reconnect with your local suppliers and your supply chain and continue with your process of due diligence. Reconnect with consumers. Use the momentum to reset your values and develop new and better choices for consumers as our societies carefully, in a planned manner, can reopen. And reconnect with stakeholders outside of your supply chain, including financiers, civil society representatives, and governments, in a joint effort towards market transformation in the interests of all the people we seek to serve. We not, must place sustainability, human rights, and responsible business conduct, including supply chain management, at the center of our activities if we are to build back better after this crisis and be sure that our businesses are future proof. I can assure you that I will do my part to be part of this successful endeavor. Thank you and wishing you a wonderful day. Thank you so much to the minister for kicking us off. Um, very pertinent comments uh, centering human rights at the core of responsible business conduct. Now, I'm very happy to move to the panel part of our discussion today. And I want to introduce to you Dante Pesce, who is the executive director of Vincular PUCB as well as a member of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. Dante will be our contributing moderator today. Thank you, Dante, for joining. Um, we as well have Cristina Sanchez, the Executive Director of the UN Global Compact Network Spain. We have Julian Pacumenko, who is the Senior Coordinator for Policy and Strategic Relations at the Global Reporting initiative and we should have as well dan neal the social transformation lead with the world benchmarking alliance but it looks like we lost dan for a moment i'm hoping that he will uh, jump back in momentarily but i think while we wait for him we will just get started with today's discussion um, I'm very interested to hear what you will be um, touching upon. And I see we have Dan back as well. Dan, you have already been introduced and we're about to start the panel. I'm glad to see that you are back. Um, so Dante and panelists, over to you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Julie, and all the panelists and the attendants. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to uh, facilitate this conversation um, with two institutions that will provide us a conversation around evidence, data, and incentives, and uh, with the Director of Global Compact uh, uh, in Spain um, that will uh, explore with us the why and how uh, to normalize the integration and the adoption of business and human rights as foundational uh, for practical business and give us a sense from the ground out of one of the networks that is actually having a more successful, let's say, approach uh, with more companies engaging and actually uh, integrating and doing. So we will have two sections uh, today, a conversation to kick off um, with the practical experience, the, the lessons learned, etc. And then a second uh, round um, with the looking forward in the context of the 20th anniversary of Global Compact, but also uh, the about to start process towards evaluating the first 10 years of the UN guiding principles and the construction uh, of the roadmap for the next 10 years starting July 1st, 2021. So we will have these two sections and we will be getting questions from the audience and hopefully we'll be able to address at least some of them uh, to better, let's say, inform and to um, guide the conversation that we will have. 
Um, in the second round, of course, of each one of the panelists will be welcome if you want to make some re remark or comment something said by the other panelists, of course, you're welcome uh, to do that. And we only have one hour in total, uh, including the final remarks. So we effectively have 45 minutes to go. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I will just initiate this conversation by saying that uh, we are living in a sort of global scale asset test of resilience in uh, testing our capacity as societies and the global society uh, to prevent, mitigate and respond to a crisis. It is the same institutional framework, the same capacity that we need to use to actually address uh, inequality, climate change and all other kind of societal challenges that surround us all in order to achieve a sustainable and just a future for all. So therefore, we need to have a reflection of what is working and what is not working that well and uh, based on the experience that we're facing right now that can greatly inform us and help us think through and then go into the evidence and go into the practical experience uh, so the, the first thing is we all agree and everyone in this session will agree that human rights is important and it, and it should be part of normal business practice and it should be at the foundation of any kind of future recovery or building back better or a better future for all. So human rights is foundation, is the basis on of responsiveness conduct. And of course, we all agree with that. But in fact, the statistics show, the practical evidence shows a mismatch between the narrative that today is relatively solid and clear with no challengers um, and the real practice on the ground. And um, just to, and as an example out of Global Compact uh, database, uh, that Global Compact conducts a survey every year to 10,000 approximately members. And the evidence, what, what is it showing? It's showing that 90% of the companies have a policy in place out of the ones that respond. That is excellent. But that is the starting point. But then only 20 to 23% have a risk assessment um, process and only 15% assess their impacts on human rights. Um, and then we don't have data, at least comparative data, that shows what's the level of integration into management systems and what is the level of implementation across the value chain, including subsidiaries, etc., and the effective effectiveness of that implementation. So the guiding principles call for companies to know and show, understand your impacts and show your commitment to them by integrating, by uh, monitoring its implementation, by learning, improving, sharing with others, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in order to make uh, real progress. So we will initiate this conversation with uh, two speakers from institutions that are actually standard setters or monitoring standards or the implementation, the effectiveness data. And we would like to ask them about what are the findings? What, are, what, is, the, what is the evidence showing to us? And, um, and, uh, and based on that evidence and findings, uh, what is this telling us? and where we can identify triggers or incentives to actually mobilize bet more and better action. So from a starting point that is okay, there is a recognition of human rights, a recognition of the guiding principles, we have moved into policies, and now what? Uh, we need to further move ahead and to understand better the dynamics. So I will I will invite our, our two guests uh, from the Global Reporting Initiative and from the World Benchmark uh, Alliance to address the audience and to give us uh, your perspective on what is the evidence showing us, where are the shortcomings in terms of incentives, and what can you share with us based on your practical experience and where from where you see the world? And then we will give um, the floor to Christina. Uh, so, uh, Julian, uh, can we kick off the conversation with you? And if you can share with us what what is it going on? Why we're not there yet? And what can we do better actually to move ahead in that direction? What is the evidence showing us and what the GRI is doing in this field? The floor is your, Julia. And thank you, NGC, for inviting GRI to address this very important topic today. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here today to speak about human rights, due diligence, and corporate transparency. So for those of you who do not know, maybe in the virtual room, uh, GRI is an independent international organization that has been pioneering sustainability reporting for more than 20 years. 
and we create a global common language for transparency. So we help organizations worldwide to understand and to communicate the impact that they have on critical sustainability issues, such as human rights. And the GRI standards are the most uh, widely used reporting framework for sustainability reporting with long-standing close cooperation with UNGC and strong alignment on the communication and progress requirements. So the first point I wanted to make today is that I really want to reaffirm today GRI's commitment to help shaping the uh, human rights reporting agenda and to support companies to ensure respect for human rights uh, through meaningful reporting. And human rights are a very important thread throughout the standards that are aligned with key international normative frameworks, including the UN Gaming Principles and the 10 Principles of the UN Global Compact, to enable companies to report the human rights impact through specific disclosures. But uh, as Dante mentioned, in terms of um, what we observe, there are some key challenges that are um, making uh, reporting difficult for companies when it comes to human rights. And I just would like to point out uh, certain uh, challenges and solutions that we see at GRI. So the first point I wanted to make is the reluctance to disclose uh, information from companies that can be attributed to the perception that disclosure can lead to liability when in fact the opposite is the case. Uh, the risk lies in the non-disclosure. This is actually evidenced by some of the high profile industry act incidents that we see. There is also some uncertainty about what issues should be covered. And another challenge that we see among companies is the lack of resources for data gathering or report writing. Businesses should actually ensure that reporting is seen as the key vehicle for information to stakeholders and not as an effort to disclose for the sake of responding to legal or societal requirements. And finally, when it comes to human rights more specifically, data can be sensitive or interpreted incorrectly. And while some aspects of human rights disclosures can be considered confidential or prone to misinterpretation, it is essential for organizations to understand the risks of failing to report on those impacts. So moving forward, we think at GRI that human rights due diligence should become integral to the management system of companies and the way they conduct business, rather than a process that gets treated as a separate element. This should also be reflected by making sure that human rights impacts are an integral part of a report instead of a standalone piece. And this way, transparency can play a crucial role to ensure business respect for human rights. Um, another element that, that we observe at GRI is a link to policy, because experience shows that the duty of governments to protect human rights cannot be fully realized through voluntary guidelines or self-regulation by companies worldwide alone. And the responsibility to account for addressing human rights impacts throughout the value chains makes the disclosure of non-financial information a critical component of due diligence and is increasingly becoming a, a legally binding obligation. And a number of European and national level legislative initiatives are also indicative of a growing trend towards managing uh, human rights due diligence, which we strongly support uh, at GRI. So that's for the setting the scene on, on our side. Thank you. Julien, and you set the stage uh, perfectly well for, for Dan from the World Benchmark Alliance because you have been monitoring uh, some companies with great detail uh, on the uh, practical integration and implementation of human rights due diligence and in, in how that looks into uh, the real world of a, a group of companies that you're actually uh, monitoring with great detail. Uh, can you share with us the same rationale? What, what does the data and the evidence uh, tells you, shows to you, and how can we interpret why we're not making progress uh, faster since the value proposition of conducting human rights due diligence is a win-win proposition? do no harm and be more competitive. There is no uh, contradiction there, but why is it that it's taking us so long uh, to make something obvious normal? The floor is yours, uh, Dan. Great, thanks very much, great to be here. Um, and Julian said quite a few things that, that I've scribbled out from anything I was thinking in my head. Um, so for those who aren't aware, again, the World Benchmarking Alliance is uh, a group that's set up to drive improved corporate performance. Uh, in terms of aligning with transformations that uh, need to be achieved to achieve the SDGs. One of the benchmarks we have is something called the Corporate Human Rights Benchmark, 
uh, which, uh, as it says, you know, we benchmark corporates on their human rights. And as Dante is referring to there, it's been running for several years in high risk sectors. They're things like the apparel sector, the agricultural product sector, the extractive sector. Um, when we look at the methodology, we're only looking at several hundred companies because we go very deep into what we're into what we're examining compared to, say, some of the surveys that are more general. So, yes, we do look at the things like the policy level, the commitments, the systems, the resourcing, the implementation, and then some of the performance elements of that. But they are very tricky to uh, to understand in terms of what is good or, or, or bad human rights performance that you can compare across sectors. But in terms of what we find, it's a bit of a depressing picture. Um, the vast majority of companies in high risk sectors are not demonstrating respect for human rights. Um, we, we see like maybe one score a year above 80 percent, but the average score is 25 percent. Fully a half of companies in the highest risk sectors for human rights abuses fail to meet any of five criteria that have been developed for human rights due diligence, grounded in the human guiding principles and then um, developed through stakeholder consultations. We have been seeing that companies come under pressure and they will improve their um, uh, their approach, but it's too small and too slow, realistically. It's like we were talking earlier today around um, when we're going to get to gender equality, but there's a sort of similar guideline um, in terms of our, our projections for when companies will all be respecting human rights. Um, as, a, as a side point, there's about half of the companies we look at are in the global compact and they scored 32 percent on average um which is double what non-global compact companies score um however if we compare a unilever at say 75 percent um but then we have a third of global compact companies scoring less than 20 percent and there's a huge variation between between those and, and as to why i mean kind of Twisting the question a little bit um, to be contentious, I think there's uh, there's three maybe three things. One, they don't have to. Two, they don't want to. And three, they're scared to. Um, so, you know, initiatives like the Modern Slavery Act, the French Law de Vigilance, the California Supply Chain Transparency Act are codifying requirements on companies to put due diligence into into law. But that's not the norm, and we heard about that in the in the opening. Um, and in most cases, it's still framed as guidance, as principles, uh, and, and as such, companies, because they legally don't have to, a lot of them just don't, as a as a standard point of view, I think. Um, also, they don't want to because it's not easy. You know, it's got an initial initial associated cost, and that initial cost is a hurdle to get over. Um, and for several companies, you know, the sad fact is there is a market failure around human rights still, and being bad for people is good for business. You know, we see some of the laggards on human rights still outperform the leaders on human rights because they are outsourcing a lot of their externalities and it's cheaper to do bad business in inverted commas. Um, and to be content with the scare to Christina, I think you might not be on mute. Um, in terms of you know, human rights due diligence, starting with identifying and assessing risks and impacts, but it's a bit of a Pandora's box. Um, and you might be afraid to open it and see what you find, not only because you have to deal with these things when you find them in line with the UNGPs, but actually it might show that your entire business model um, is fundamentally flawed if it's based on exploitation and externalizing harm. And, and addressing that is just going to be going to be challenging. So I think there are some real issues there. And as said, Dante, the, the case is there to be made, but um, the problem is it's not, I think, been bought in by a lot of the companies so far. Thank you, Dan. And, and actually, I'm, I'm parking some uh, questions from the audience and some uh, reflection coming out of your two interventions around the enabling environment, the role of public policy, what governments can actually do, the level playing field, uh, the policy developments taking place in Europe, but not taking place in the rest of the world, and how can we actually converge on that level. So I'm parking some ideas, I'm reading to the questions, SMEs, 
uh, showed up. And, and actually, with that element, I would like to go to Cristina, because uh, Global Compact Spain, and I, I have witnessed that, is a, a network that is normally on the lead. It has a very, very big, um, let's say, uh, participation of business, not only big brands and listed companies that will have, let's say, incentives more clearly on them, coming from the investors and other stakeholders, but also a lot of SMEs are in your network. So can you get, 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 guide us through uh, what are you doing and what are you learning? What are the obstacles that real companies face, or at least your members tell you, the ones that are trying to do the right thing, the ones that are trying to integrate human rights into their normal business practices, what are they telling you? And you have been conducting actually surveys, listening to them, engaging quite a bit. So can you illuminate uh, what are your findings uh, to give us an idea in how, what is going on? What is the picture on the ground? What are you listening? And uh, including the angle of SMEs um, and, and, and get it from there uh, to go into the next round and what can we do better and what do we need to address into the future? So the floor is yours, Christina. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Dante. It's a pleasure to, to share our experience in Spain with, with you. So, um, actually, we have been uh, working in the Spanish network for around 10 years in these issues. Human rights has been always in the core of our activities and action with our companies. And in these 10, 12 years, we have been uh, evolution, actually, in some of the companies. But we can see also a difference, a, a big difference is between large companies, uh, small companies, and also between different business sectors. There's, there are some sectors with uh, uh, more uh, action, more due diligence implementing in their, in their business. Not a lot of them, actually, but some of them, they have been improving uh, their, their activity in human rights. And then we have um, all the small and medium companies. We have 60% of our, our participants are SMEs. We think this is one of the main challenges uh, of Global Compact to keep growing and to keep uh, scaling the, the initiative and the impact of the 10 principles and SDGs. And if um, companies have been improving in uh, gender equality, in climate change, in other issues, human rights has, human rights has been always uh, a lack of action and we have been uh, analyzing and we have surveys, we have been doing uh, trainings um, and we have in contact with all of our companies and we can see that there is a commitment and uh, human rights policies in 80% uh, more or less of our signatories but then when we go deeply in the due diligence process of the guiding principles, there's nothing almost in, uh, in those strategies in human rights. So, and if we, and we are talking about large companies who are aware about their risk and the impact, especially in the supply chain, which is one of the most difficult uh, areas to work uh, about human rights. So, um, Yes, then the, the SMEs, they don't even know the guiding principles. They don't understand that the business activity has an impact in this in human rights. I think also there is a lack of information and understanding what is human rights. There's something very large, it's a concept very large with some for some businesses they don't understand what that this means and they don't know the guiding principles they don't know how to implement it they don't know that there is a due diligence to map the risk to to implement a step by step a methodology and so we have been working first of all in awareness uh, to make understand what is human rights what is uh, the guiding principles, and then we are trying to just uh, help them and just go with them to in the, in the implementation of the due diligence. There, we have also good practices and we have a good, a really, really good examples. But in, if we compare it with another areas of sustainability, human rights is really the area more difficult for our companies. 
and Christina, can I follow up with a question about the the, yeah. the obstacles? Uh, why why is it uh, so difficult? What are the let's say the practice? You you said the understanding of human rights, but yeah, but let's say from a risk management perspective, if if you consider uh, the violation of human rights or the uh, let's say impacting negatively on people as risk for the success of the company, it, it makes perfect sense to understand what are those impacts and actually manage them preventatively. And, and many companies do well in terms of health and safety or preventing uh, corruption. So uh, what, what is it uh, that uh, is actually uh, producing this obstacle in terms of, uh, you, you already said the communication into how to be, let's say, to package human rights. But beyond that, is there anything else that is underlying uh, it's an underlying obstacle that we should be taking into account and considering. Well, I think uh, companies, they are improving in gender equality, in, um, in other areas like, as I said, uh, climate change, in the integration of, of all diversity in the companies. The problem is that they don't use the human rights language. So since they are not using the good indicators and they are not putting the same perspective in the asset, in the um, in the monitoring of the results, the indicators, then they we cannot see the picture of all this action. If we are talking about gender equality, which is a human right for women, or if we are uh, talking about wealth issues, which are also human rights, they work in a separate cases. That's why they are they feel I think more comfortable with the SDGs because they they see what are they talking about there's like indicators they they are used to, to to work with but then when we try to explain them the importance of uh, applying this language about human rights and to use the same um indicators and then the same language and the due diligence they don't see the connection between every all of these issues and the human rights so that's why I think they are improving in the implementation of the or in the contribu contribution of uh, the achievement of the of the SDGs because they understand what they are talking about. They have been working about these issues a long time ago, so they feel better, more comfortable. That companies, when you talk about human rights, they just feel a little bit lost. Not the large companies that they are working with the supply chain, but you know, the normal company, in a, a medium company, they, we need to train our the employees and to, to try to them to use the same vocabulary that we are used to use. Okay, so but that's that's somehow good news because it means that there are not, uh, let's say, obstacles that are almost impossible to to overcome. Uh, because what you're signaling is that uh, clarifying expectations, connecting the dots in a way that a practitioner can understand and to be clear about what the expectations mean around uh, human rights and human rights due diligence uh, could actually get through because there seems not to be, let's say, like an ideological or let's say underlining uh, obstacle or resistance uh, against uh, doing the right thing by uh, actually being the, the smart thing to do as well. So thank you very much, Christina, with that uh, reflection because it gives uh, hope in terms that we can do better into the future. And, and, and I will go back to our, the three panelists in the same order to look into the future and to, uh, this is the, the closing question for um, all the participants in this uh, session, is that um, Global Compact is celebrating 20 years um, and the guiding principles will start evaluating the first 10 years and think into the future. So um, the, let's say two or three key things that must or should happen to ensure effective scaling of business and human rights in the decade to come. There is a, a number of elements that have been already mentioned by you. Uh, the enabling environment, uh, the uh, mandatory versus non-mandatory, the smart mix that we say in terms of policy framework, uh, the collective action needed to actually 
push a, a sector or an overall industry into the same direction, benchmarking, comparing one to another, stimulating races to the top, um, and competition on the right side in the pre-competitive space. So there are lots of, let's say, elements that have been highlighted already. Some of them have been said by you already. So I, I would invite you to uh, think, uh, think with us and we think together uh, in how can we move into the next implementation, recognizing and celebrating what we have been do doing well and where we are right now, which is not a complete failure, we have some progress, but how can we move into the next decade in fully normalizing uh, something that should be at the basis and, uh, and it should be a no-brainer for business to embed. So, Julian, uh, the floor is yours for your final remarks and your reflections into the future. Thank you. To, uh, to keep brief with three main points that I wanted to, uh, to leave the session uh, with. So the, the first one is just to uh, reaffirm again that transparency is an enabler for us to greater accountability and behavioral change. And for that purpose, one key takeaway that we see at GRI is that we need a clear alignment of standards worldwide. Um, and that is why actually at the moment we have been working um, on the update of the human rights related standards. So the work started in uh, 2018 with the appointment of a technical committee with 10 members who worked on um, updating the, the standards that had been created in, in 2011 when it comes to, to human rights. And uh, one of the key uh, aspects of this, of this review, and I, I saw a question in the chat, is to align the standards with uh, frameworks and intergovernmental uh, the normative uh, um, pieces such as the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, the due diligence guidance, and also the ILO conventions. So I would really want to, to point out this, uh, this work that we're doing at the moment because we, we actually opened the, the draft standards for public consultation uh, last week, and the, the public comment is going to be open for three months, so I would really invite uh, uh, all of the participants today to uh, to, uh, to check this work and, and provide input because it's very valuable for us to get uh, as much input as we can from very various uh, stakeholders. Um, so yes, my, my first takeaway from, from this conversation would be to, to keep the, the standards clean, keep the standards aligned and making sure that there is coherence between, between the standards. Um, uh, a second point that I wanted to mention is that uh, organizations should really integrate human rights uh, due diligence into business processes and leverage them as a tool to address uh, systemic issues throughout the, the value chains. So due diligence is the starting point and it should be embedded into management approaches and the way that companies conduct business rather than a process that gets treated as a separate element by organization. So this should also be reflected in reporting by making sure that all the impacts are an integral part of uh, the report instead of a standalone piece. So moving forward, businesses need to show much greater ambition and leadership and to scale up their responsibility to respect human rights. So this is a, a call to action, uh, if I may, uh, that, I, that I wanted to address today. And I, I think that for this purpose, businesses new, need to utilize what is already out there. So both in terms of the framework, so the UN getting principles or the UN 10 principles, but also what is available in terms of timetable and schedule. And for that, we have the, the global agenda and the sustainable development goals. Uh, and, and one last uh, point I wanted to make also to, um, to answer some of your uh, of the uh, comments you addressed, uh, uh, Dante, is on policy coherence and policy action. And of course, we had a, a full uh, UN forum last year on the, on the topic, so I only have a few minutes to, uh, to address this, so that definitely won't be enough, but it's also something that we see as a very important uh, criteria at GRI, and we've been working on analyzing um, all the uh, sustainability regulations out there, uh, not only on human rights reporting, but also environmental reporting, and we're going to launch early next month the, the next edition of the Carrots and Sticks report, uh, which will give a, a qualitative uh, and quantitative uh, description of all this uh, regulations. And, and we observe that, uh, unfortunately, um, the measures on, uh, on uh, disclosures of non-financial information and the, and the regulatory uh, uh, legislations uh, are framed very differently in terms of scope and obligation uh, across the world. 
And it's very challenging uh, uh, to have such a regulatory landscape uh, of overlapping or sometimes misaligned obligations. So um, here again, I would like to, uh, yeah, to, to ask for the need for coherence between, between policies and, uh, and of course, working on the smart mix between uh, policy and uh, regulatory measures, both, both, both in the regional context, uh, such as, for instance, the EU uh, non-financial reporting directive that is being reviewed at the moment, but also in, in national context. Uh, Julianne, and, and just to say that the Office of the High Commissioner uh, ha is part of the working group that you put together, uh, the GRI, uh, so have been contributing actively to the content and the consistency of, of uh, your about to be published uh, standard on uh, human rights due diligence, uh, transparency, uh, and um, so that, that will be welcome, of course, to add more clarity and to uh, have an, a better understanding of what is expected in terms of business uh, behavior, but also practice and evidence of uh, uh, of effectiveness. So thank you very much, Julian. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Daniel. Uh, there are a lot of things on the table right now. Um, so we, we need to look into the future and the floor is yours. Great. Um, so for, for, for my future, we're we're looking at taking elements of our human rights assessment and expanding them out to 2,000 companies, um, and that will go through for the next 10 years. And these are the 2,000 companies which are going to be most influential for whether we're able to achieve the SDGs and the transformations uh, that are needed to happen over the next decade. Um, but that's part of a wider ecosystem. So data is just data. You actually need to bring together an alliance of people to use that information, whether that's consumers or whether it's governments or whether it's investors. And so actually I think one of the things to go forward is actually the the use of this information, whether it's individuals using their pensions to opt out of things, whether it's investors actually living up to their principles for responsible investment and using this information to put their money where their mouth is. Um, but I think in terms of uh, scaling, for me, and it was touched on earlier, we need to shift understanding of the purpose of the corporation. So the shareholder primacy model of business is a key driver of unsustainable development um, and human rights impacts because it enables companies to justify negative impacts on people and planet by hiding behind the fig leaf of fiduciary duty. Um, so having more purposeful corporations that serve society, not capital, I think will be key to getting companies to fulfill their obligations because it will deal with that kind of back and forth issue that we have. Um, secondly, yes, uh, there was, a, in the intro, it was like, let's not have a race to the bottom. Well, we've already raced to the bottom. You know, every other chocolate bar is made by children in, in, in terms of the cocoa supply chain. There's 25 million plus people in modern slavery. Um, so if we, if we recognize that there's a bottom, actually, we need to raise the floor to deal with the free riders at the bottom. And that's where that legislation mix comes in. And lastly, I think it's a great opportunity for Global Compact as well to lead the way by ensuring that its members are all doing what they should be doing on human rights due diligence. And I think, you know, the Global Compact we're looking at the, the future of the SDG ambitions, and that's that's great, but I think there's a real risk of, of SDG washing on that if the basics aren't in place. And as we've seen seen with all the stats, the basics aren't in place, and people should not be given their, their, their blue tick if they can't um, put those basics in place because they're fundamental, and without that, it'll undermine the SDGs being achieved. Thank you, Daniel, uh, and very, very good point. Actually, in conversation that we're having from the, the working group angle, business and human rights, looking into the next decade, that is exactly the, the last point you made, that we are engaging in conversation with industry associations and uh, associations that are um, by self-selected group of companies. So the expectation should be crystal clear, but our expectation is to become and if the company in a period of reasonable time doesn't show enough progress, it should be uh, kicked off, uh, basically, and, and not, get, not get the recognition to be in the UN family somehow. Companies that over a period of 5, 10, 15, 20 years uh, have not done what they should have been done, doing for a long time now. So we understand that we need to go incremental, but, but of course that is a key point in terms of looking into the 
future, making clear expectations linked to evidence of performance improvement and implementation um, on the, and then of course on, on scale on the supply chain, industry associations that you belong to and all over the world where you have uh, activities. And at the same time, not incentivize uh, unintended negative consequences. So uh, the, the risking in a way that you basically move away from uh, low, uh, low income countries or weak governance uh, zones, where we need the leverage and we need the champions to remain in and to use their collective power to actually get things better and not worse than them by protecting the brand. So that's also a conversation that we're starting to have and how to push harder and more in a more real way and at the same time avoid the unintended negative consequences uh, that we might be facing by the risking too fast instead of dealing and addressing the the impact so thank you very much daniel because you're you're signaling a lot of let's say of the elements that we need to put into an honest conversation about feeling good with our achievements but also understanding uh what are our uh, let's say challenges into the future uh we're not not finger pointing but trying to understand how can we actually deal and address and overcome those challenges so thanks again uh christina uh lastly with you um and we actually have the right time uh to listen to you so we are on time um your reflection we need to look into the future uh daniel has been very uh, let's say assertive uh, with you specifically talking about directly global compact uh, uh with global compact members um i had a small interruption at home and we're all at home right now and um so, uh, Christina, you, you have heard what uh, we have been discussing. We need to look into the future. We need to uh, unpack the full potential of the guiding principles. We need to make human rights real for companies. And you're in a very uh, good position uh, to actually help that happen. Um, so looking into the future, two, three reflections. And, and how can we make this that now is not normal and turn it into normal, starting by your own members. So the floor is yours, Christina, and you will have the final word. Thank you. Thank you, Dante. Well, that's a good question. I don't know if I have the answer, but uh, I think one of the main challenges, because I was talking more about the internal management, about human rights, employees, maybe customers or clients, but I think one of the main challenges uh, that it has been always there, like 10 years ago, and now we are talking about the same, is the supply chain management of our human rights. And I know it's a very, very complex issue. We need like three leader summit just to talk and to have some good conclusion about how to manage the, the supply chain. However, I think, um, and this is another issue that I think is, is important and is related about partnership and about collaboration. Um, and is the, the, the role of the international community and the governments to work with uh, companies and the civil society to bring this uh, common framework so this would help companies to manage this very, very complex um, issue about uh, super chain. And also, um, I mean, it's just to point some challenge because I think there's it's very, very complex, uh, the, the, this issue about super chain, but I think it's important. And also um, about the SDGs, we have not been talking about the SDGs, but I think this, there is a connection between human, human rights and the 17 SDGs. And I think uh, since the last uh, years, we have been seeing that the companies uh, are um, working and developing a lot of policies and commitment about, with, uh, with the SDGs we should try to make more connection between one framework and another one. And uh, for just the last uh, words, I think uh, we as a global compact, we should keep going, uh, raising awareness about human rights and how important it is to build uh, stable markets and stable societies where companies can develop their act business activities Without this stability and with this, this uh, the human rights about of the society, these markets won't be um, able to keep growing and uh, developing. So it's in the interest of everyone 
to build this framework and this common language about human rights. It's in a few minutes we can develop all these answers to all these challenges, but I think um, we should keep in mind this, um, this issue, supply chain, SMEs, government, commitment and work in, in, in their national uh, plans with the um, business and human rights. And I think we, this should be helping to just going forward. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Christina. We're, we are actually indeed uh, in the next 10 years project that we are going to launch and, and actually new executive director of Global Compact is expected to join the launching uh, event on the 7th of July. Uh, we are planning uh, with the business and human rights team of Global Compact in New York a series of engagements with the networks and to bring in the voice of the networks and the voice of the members to basically uh, acknowledge and address uh, this uh, big questions and how can we do better and how can we move into and how can we move from a few pioneers to mainstreaming, etc. So, of course, we will count on you, as always do, um, in order to participate in that illuminate uh, the future. And we're also thinking on how to connect dots and how to harmonize a narrative that can be understood by normal people, policymakers, civil society, unions, indigenous and business of all sizes. And, and what you just said is one of the actually our, our challenges, but our goals is to connect the dots in terms of the overarching uh, narrative and expectations, connecting with the sustainable development agenda, connecting with climate change, connecting with uh, peace and prosperity, connecting with anti-corruption and integrity, um, connecting with, uh, uh, with um, well, in, in, in basically creating a virtuous alignment in where we can basically be able to aspire to greater uh, uptake um, in reality. And for that, we need to bring in the expertise that is analyzing at the high end, let's say the GRI and the World Business uh, and the World Benchmark Alliance, and the ones that are actually working with like the Global Compact Networks and everyone else that is not yet part of this conversation and that everyone else is a quite wide and numerous group of companies and policymakers and civil society uh, people. So we need to build this coalition behind and how to address and go into the future with greater with a new vision and greater ambition. So I want to thank everyone uh, for your participation. Uh, of course, there are a lot of questions that will remain unanswered in this uh, uh, let's say one hour overall session. I hope that in the future we're not a side event parallel session on human rights being central uh, and being foundational. So let's say my own expectation will be to be more central to the conversation than a little bit, uh, let's say, on the side. Uh, but at least we're moving in the right direction. That's our feeling. And I thank the panelists very much and the attendants very much. And I will give the floor back to Julie for the final remarks and the final intervention. So uh, thank you all, and I'll leave the floor now in the hands of Julie. Thank you so much, Dancy, and thank you so much to Julien, Christina, and Dan for a really interesting discussion. I think just from the amount of questions that has come in in the chat function, you can see that people are very engaged and would really like to uh, no more. Thank you to um, Julianne and to Dan for sharing the links to your respective um, web pages, especially on the uh, consultation process for the GRI. Now, I think that's very helpful for everybody to know that you are able to chime in. There's one last question that uh, I thought was interesting, just because we've talked a lot about uh, standards and having a, a global approach and there was a question around how it's going with the treaty negotiations uh, in Geneva and whether or not an actual treaty on this is something that would be helpful. Um, Dante, I don't know if you want to say just a very few words about this or if any of uh, the others who are working on this particularly, not the treaty negotiations, negotiations as such, but on the standardization, if you have anything to add, but I thought that was an important um, question because these negotiations have been going on for a very long time. Yeah, well, I, I can say 
a word in one minute because I'm I'm conscious that we are six minutes from the end and we're going to be kicked out uh, from online and in, in a second from now and there is a final recorded message for you to show, uh, Julie. So, uh, in in short, uh, the the negotiation for uh, a binding treaty on um, business and human rights is following its uh, let's say process and it's a process led uh, by two governments, uh, Ecuador in South Africa. The working group. Uh, has remained engaged with that process and one fundamental thing uh, that is our aspiration and the leadership of that process have assured that that is the case it will build on top of the guiding principles so we are uh, participating in terms of uh, making sure that there is consistency and that we are not uh, let's say uh, watering down or some high diminishing the value of the guiding principles so the the fundamental part of uh, the uh, of the the, the treaty, if it goes into the future, if it happens, let's say eventually that process ends, and it, it, it might end, at the very minimum, it should be consistent. There's agreement on that in the guiding principles, uh, existing guiding principles and the ones that we have been discussing is foundational for that process. And, uh, and we are willing and, and, and the leadership of that process is willing to create all the right set of synergies in, in order to make it uh, a complement and not a competition. Uh, so I'll say that's the basics of, of it. And that is the, let's say the good news that that process is is meant to be complementary um, and, and we're working with them and contributing to that process with that in mind. So Excellent. Thank you so much, Dan, uh, to Dante. I ensure you that we won't actually be kicked off the platform, so we won't um, very vigorously shut down at 3 p.m., but other sessions are starting, so we should try to adhere to, to the timeline. Um, if none of the other speakers wants to chime in on this, I um, will just thank them again so very much for being part of the session. As I said before, it has been a very interesting discussion. Um, and I would encourage all of the participants and those of you that pose questions to engage in the networking feature as well here on the session. Uh, you can uh, try to talk uh, bilaterally with people there and, and, and further pursue the different questions that were posed. So with that, we will end our session with closing remarks by Gregorio Dimitriadis, who is the Secretary General of International Economic Affairs of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Greece. Thanks again so much, everyone, for joining. Crisis test our value, confronting us with dilemmas and choices crucial to our democracies and communities. Crisis of all kinds, whether they are economic, or related to health as it is today, require quick and drastic answers to avoid the worst outcome. In the case of COVID-19, the restrictions imposed under the guidance of the scientific community were accepted by all democratic societies because they aimed to protect human life. They were, of course, temporary. In Greece, most restrictions have already been lifted and progressively, we are enjoying our freedom again. During the Greek government's fight against COVID-19, I realized the importance of universal values in my effort to procure the necessary medical materials for our healthcare system. And I have to say, I am optimistic for the future. As long as we strengthen international cooperation and establish peaceful relations among nations, solidarity will always prevail Coupled with government accountability and democratic control, freedom and human rights will not be threatened, even in the greatest crisis. This is why in Greece, human rights are at the top of our agenda. The Greek government, assuming the presidency of the Council of Europe, is on June 25th, an international virtual conference on human rights in business. Everyone is welcome and invited to attend via live streaming. 
The event aims to initiate an open discussion on the issue of human rights in the workplace and the role of businesses in offering equal opportunities, inclusiveness and diversity. While the primary focus of this conference will be on LGBT plus rights, it will also touch upon related issues such as gender equality. And we will work towards organizing similar events for other issues concerning human rights. The objective is to serve as fertile ground for the enhancement of meaningful cooperation between states, international organizations, the business sector and the civil society for effective human rights promotion and protection. We expect the conference to conclude with a call to action and the setup of working groups to explore issues further and propose concrete next steps. Working together will have a positive impact to the lives of thousands of people who currently hide or face discrimination and will improve the overall growth, well-being and cohesion of our societies. With initiatives such as this, Greece hopes to send a message to citizens around the world that human rights should be emphasized even if not especially in the most challenging times. Thank you so much everyone that's the end of the session have a great rest of the summit and thank you again to all of our panelists bye everyone